Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. We're, to- we're all tired out from talking already. Is this computer working? Yeah. Is it working now? I sure hope it is. Woo! My iMac did a little number on us and, yeah. and it took us a half hour to yeah, get going. Yeah, so we got passionate talking. Oh, yeah. yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. We strongly advise listener discretion. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. Chomp, chomp, chomp. <laughs> Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or UK, text 741741. The service will match you with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. Let's get on with the show. Yeah. On September 27, 2017, the Vancouver Police Department responded to a call for a wellness check on the couple who lived at 1243 West 64th Avenue in the quiet South Vancouver neighborhood called Marpole. Inside the home, even the most seasoned officers were shocked by the grisly scene. They discovered blood spattered all over the walls and floors. Further in, they found the mutilated bodies of the senior couple who lived there. The scene sounds like such a juxtaposition to the location. The Marpole area is very affluent, mm. very beautiful. Yeah. You know, depending on where you are, you can look out your back window and see the ocean. You can see the uh, island. Yeah. Like it's just beautiful and tranquil. And oh, yeah. So quite the juxtaposition to what's in the house. You are listening to Dark Poutine, episode 139, The Marpole Murders, Diana Ma Jones and Richard Jones. From court documents, Anthony Purcell, who worked with Diana Ma Jones, went to the Jones residence on September 27 because Diana had not come to work or called in sick, and no one at work contacted her. Mm. As he approached the front of the residence, Anthony observed a hatchet with blood on it and a knife near the front pathway. So leading up to the house. Leading up to the house. Oh, Jesus. Mr. Purcell ultimately went to the back door of the residence and saw bloody footprints on the back steps. The screen door was closed, but the main door was open. After calling out and receiving no response, Mr. Purcell stepped into the back entrance of the residence and observed a large pool of blood in the kitchen. He went back out of the house and called 911. End quote. So just out of curiosity, at what point would you, like, would you have gone in the house? I don't think I would if I saw, like, an, a hatchet and stuff and then bloody footprints on the outside. Now that I've researched this episode, yeah. I probably wouldn't have gone yeah. in the house. Because I, I think in my mind, I'm like, I think I, if I'm in calling out and nobody's answering, mm-hmm. I think I'd be like, I know what I'm going to see in there and I can't handle that, so I got to call. I would probably But then again, maybe you'd sit there and go like, shit, maybe they are still, they need help. Exactly. So maybe, yeah. Two of the first officers on the scene that day around 1.30 p.m. were VPD constables Phil Enns and Peter Swan. 
Outside on the path leading to the front of the house, they found a sheathed orange starfrit knife as well as blood-stained hatchet that Mr. Purcell had seen. Not sure what awaited them inside, the officers armed themselves. Yeah. Constable Swan armed himself with a semi-automatic rifle and ends drew with his sidearm. The door showed no signs of tampering and there were no signs of any break-in. The officers entered, announcing themselves at Vancouver Police and called out, Anyone home? There was no answer. Just inside the front door were Costco brand grocery bags, some still full, but others laid tipped over and the contents were strewn about, indicating a struggle. Police also found a Costco receipt laying nearby. It was from the Richmond store dated the evening of the day before. There were blood stains in the living room and large droplets leading into the kitchen. The home's kitchen was awash with blood. Shit. One of the officers slipped in it, almost falling. It was evident from the amount of blood that at least one person had been brutally attacked there. N said later, Immediately we observed the floor was completely blood stained. You could barely see the tile. You could tell something catastrophic. That would be quite a terrifying scene. There was twine tied to one of the legs of a kitchen chair. A large amount of blood was on the floor near the chair. Large bloody trails led down the hallway from the kitchen to what the officers perceived to be the bathroom. Someone had dragged two large objects there. Mm. The door to the bathroom was closed. The officers could hear that the water in the shower was running at full blast. As they opened the door, they noted the hot water had filled the room with hot steam. Swan later described what he saw. I was overcome with the steam, blood, he said. My first observation was what appeared to be the outline of a human body. Swan reefed open the glass door. There were two bodies, an older male and a female, both deceased. Their descriptions fit those of the owners of the home, Diana Ma Jones, 64, and Richard Jones, 68. Their identities were later confirmed. Holy shit. Yeah. This, that's, this is a very visual one so far. Like, I'm, I can really picture myself coming into the home, a hatchet, a knife, a room covered in blood. From court documents, quote, Sergeant Thomas Watts, an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis, I guess like Dexter, mm -hmm. except without being the serial killer, <laughs> examined the residence. He noted that the only area in the kitchen where blood spatter was higher than waist level was in the area leading into the kitchen from the back door. There were no blood spatter or blood stain patterns on the upper walls or ceiling of the kitchen. If the attack were frenetic or wild, one would expect to see more spatter and impact stains, or at least some evidence of that kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. If a person repeatedly strikes a victim with a sharp weapon, it will pick up blood from the victim. If a person is striking the victim in a wild way, the blood accumulated on the weapon will hit the walls and ceiling of the room in a cast-off or spatter patterns. There were no such patterns in the kitchen area. There were no bloody fingerprints that did not belong to either Mr. or Mrs. Jones, but there were what appeared to be blood transfers from someone wearing gloves mm. that stained different surfaces throughout the residence. Police also found a blood-stained black baseball cap with the word Canada embroidered into it beneath the likeness of a loon, and that was under a tipped-over white wooden chair in the kitchen. A loon, eh? Huh? Yeah. Mm. Outside, as well as what were presumed to be the murder weapons, were bloody footprints leading down the back staircase. The prints led down the path along the side of Little Blue Stucco House toward the front of the home. Along that same path, all the way to the street, were large blood droplets. One set of keys to the couple's white Kia Soul was missing, as was the vehicle itself. A few items in the home were missing, including the wallets belonging to the older couple and some inexpensive jewelry. Not enough to determine robbery as the sole motive for the violence employed in the murders. So, so far it seems like it's the, it's the proverbial controlled chaos. Mm -hmm. You know, to, talking about the slashing and stuff, it wasn't just this frenetic craziness. We uh, get into that. We'll get into uh, that. Okay. It had not been burglary either, as the attack on the first victim, Diana, had taken place as she came through the door with her Costco bags. Yeah. It appeared the murderer had come into the house and attacked Diana from behind as she entered. Surprise attack, I guess, yeah. The state of the home and the number of wounds inflicted on Richard and Diana's bodies indicated a sustained and violent attack. Overkill. Oh, Jesus. From court documents, quote, 
The blood transfer stains on the living room floor established that Mrs. Ma Jones was assaulted in the living room, suffered a bloodletting injury, and was dragged into the kitchen where her throat was cut. From the blunt force injuries to Ms. Ma Jones, it is evident that Ms. Ma Jones struggled when her killer attacked what was presumed to be the murderer's DNA was under her left fingernails. That, those panicked struggles, mm-hmm. just chilling, knowing that what is, what is going on, somebody's trying to, somebody's stabbing me, stabbing, and just you scratch just, and like, bite and do whatever you can. That's got to be a fear that is just unlike anything else. Forensic pathologist Dr. Ord determined that Ms. Ma Jones died as the result of multiple injuries, likely primary due to an incised wound to the front of her neck that severed her carotid artery, causing rapid and catastrophic blood loss, or possibly due to the blunt force injury to her chest region. Ms. Ma Jones had numerous blunt force injuries to her head, limbs, and torso, including a fractured nose, a broken rib, and bruising to her chest. Aside from the wound to her neck, Ms. Ma Jones had only a few sharp force injuries. Dr. Ord did not find any injuries to Ms. Ma Jones' neck that were consistent with choking. There were some petechial and frank areas of hemorrhage within the conjunctival recesses of both eyelids, which can be evidence of choking. However, Dr. Ord's opinion is the blunt force injury has likely caused the hemorrhages to the bridge of the nose, which fractured Ms. Ma Jones' nose and blackened her eyes. But she did put up a fight. <sighs> yeah, which is, I don't know why I always get a little bit of satisfaction from that, you know, that um, there was some violence put back to the perpetrator. Yeah. Like, this is just bloody. It's brutal. Bloody, this is bloody. probably one of our most brutal episodes. Yeah. Based on the autopsy and bloodstain evidence, it was determined that the killer attacked Mr. Jones as he entered into the kitchen, and then subjected him to a prolonged and violent attack in the kitchen area. (laughs) There was blood spatter near the entrance to the kitchen. The blood spatter and blood stains in the kitchen area where a large amount of blood was found are consistent with the killer conducting a controlled attack on Mr. Jones while he was lying on the floor, as opposed to wildly stabbing the older man. Hmm. While it cannot be said how long the attack on Mr. Jones lasted, it can be inferred that the wounds Mr. Jones suffered would have taken considerable time to inflict. Jesus, that's a terrifying thought. Well, listen to this. Oh, God. Dr. Ord's opinion is that Mr. Jones died of multiple sharp force injuries. He documented over 100 sharp (sighs) force injuries on Mr. Jones' body which he characterized as a mixture of stab wounds, slash wounds, and chop-style wounds. So somebody was, shall we say, enjoying taking the time to hurt and torture this man. Most of the wounds Mr. Jones suffered were stab wounds. Some of the stab wounds were severe, and some were superficial. The majority of the injuries showed symptoms of being inflicted before death or around the time of death. Many of the wounds were in clusters and were aligned in the same direction. Several wounds on Mr. Jones' leg were evenly spaced. Dr. Ord's opinion was that the spacing of the wounds on Mr. Jones' leg indicated he was not moving at the time the injuries were sustained. Mm. Dr. Ord did not identify any injuries to Mr. Jones' hands that were consistent with defensive injuries except for a possible defensive injury on the back of his left arm. There were seven probable chop wounds on the right side of Mr. Jones' head and neck, end quote. DNA found on the knife from outside the Jones residence also matched that of the DNA found underneath Diana Ma Jones' fingernails. Mm. Vancouver's local news outlets quickly picked up on the story, and as word of the brutal double murders made its way around the city, Vancouverites were terrified. Yeah. Late in the afternoon on the day after the crime, VPD investigators announced the identity of the couple. Here's a brief snippet from the VPD press conference. It was apparent to all listening that the police had no real leads. Public safety is always an issue for us. It's a top priority for our department. Right now, this file is our priority. We've got lots of men and women working around the clock to solve this crime. We haven't been able to create a to discover a clear motive in this event. Uh, We don't know if it's targeted, we don't know if it's a random act. And that's why we're coming forward and just reminding the public to remain vigilant, um, report suspicious activity to us. Let us filter it out, let us decide whether or not something's suspicious. But if you see something that just doesn't feel right in your gut or you feel that your safety is at risk, call 911 immediately. 
Richard and Diana were much loved, and as far as anyone knew, they had no enemies. A memorial post for Diana from the UBC Faculty of Medicine gave an idea of precisely the type of person the community had lost when she was murdered. Quote, Diana Ma Jones was a dedicated, highly respected, and caring occupational therapist at GF Strong Rehabilitation Center at Vancouver Coastal Health for more than 35 years. She was well known across the region, province, and nationally in the field of occupational therapy for her contribution to the continuing education of rehabilitation professionals by offering courses to home clinical reasoning skills. This year, Diana was named the VCH and Provincial Healthcare Hero at the HEABC's annual BC Healthcare Awards event. So committed to health. Definitely. Diana was a clinical associate professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy, supporting occupational therapy fieldwork students with skill, compassion, and untamed energy. With her can-do attitude, she contributed to numerous departmental activities over the years, including her service on admission interview panels, facilitator of small group tutorials, and SAGE participant on the Community Advisory Circle during the development of the Master Occupational Therapy curriculum. In recognition of her tremendous contribution to the profession of occupational therapy, in 2015, Diana was named the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapists BC Chapter's Outstanding Occupational Therapist of the Year, a well-deserved accolade for an inspiring mentor, friend, author, and gifted clinician, end quote. Wow. So what a talented Mm -hmm. individual seemingly very passionate about what she does totally. and helping others. Police continued appealing to the public for help. The night after the murders, officers responded to a location around Cartier Street and Park Drive at around 9.30. Someone had found the couple's Kia Soul. Mm. It was parked and unoccupied just 650 meters northwest of the scene of the murders. Oh, so not far at all. Not far at all. Odd as to why they would even take it if that's the case. Uh, the couple had run an Airbnb suite out of their basement, so investigators looked into mm. possible connections yeah. with that. Makes sense. That was a dead end. All the efforts to figure out who killed Diana and Richard initially came up empty. It seemed to be a random attack, one of the most challenging types of crime to solve. No kidding. On October 3rd, 2017, a week after the murders, police were requesting dash cam and surveillance camera footage. Quote, regarding the period from noon on September 26th and noon on September 27th, from anyone who lives in the area bounded by West 70th Avenue to the south, West 58th to the north, Oak Street to the east, and Granville to the west. So they had like a, a yeah. rectangle that they Kind of made a grid. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I love about current technology. From a Global News article, quote, We think the public can play a role in solving this crime. Something as simple as dash cam footage from a vehicle driving through the area last Tuesday could help with this mm-hmm. case, said Vancouver Police Constable Jason Doucette in a release. We're asking residents in the area to provide us with a copy of their security footage and check their property for discarded items that don't belong, end quote. A newspaper carrier came forward and told police that he'd observed a hatchet and starfruit knife on the front lawn of the Jones residence when he was delivering the newspaper at approximately 4 a.m. Hmm. on September 27, 2017. But I guess it's dark, so he doesn't really look into it. Yeah. He's just delivering the paper, you know? He's probably, like, yeah, it's, you would remember. You'd be like, oh, that's odd, but yeah. Someone maybe just let, what, was walking by and threw it there, yeah. or maybe someone like, was working with something outside. Like you said, 4 a.m., it's pitch yeah. dark. You know, you probably can't make out blood or anything like that. The, the appeal for help brought hundreds of hours of residential and hmm. business footage to the police. A team of technical investigators assigned to the case began sorting through the scores of video clips in the hope of seeing the killer close to the time of the killings. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. What are your thoughts so far, Scott? Yeah, as I was saying a little bit ago, like it's um, something I love about technology is just we've seen, um, you know, uh, what was that guy, Chris Watts or whatever that yep. twat waffle in, in in the States who killed his wife. and. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. 
In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters, and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat, available now. Kids, and a big component of him getting... Uh, caught and captured was the neighbor's ring footage. Right. You know, while and watching... we, we saw that again with Douglas Garland. In, absolutely. In that episode. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I love that um, technology is making it harder to be a criminal. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are upset about the privacy concerns, but uh, yeah, you know I mean, what? For sure. If you're doing something that you're, you shouldn't be doing, then you shouldn't have any privacy for that anyway. For sure. Uh, And and I'm a big privacy advocate. Like, I don't think people's privacy should be infringed on. But the thought that there's somebody out there watching every single thing that is happening, no, that's that's not humanly possible. Yeah, guess what? Your life is boring. (laughs) Well, that is the fact. Yeah. Yeah, that is, you're gonna see me eating Doritos a lot, yeah, exactly. watching on the couch. And staring at uh, yep. a Big Brother on TV. Like I'm willing to give a little privacy while I'm out walking around in public streets for the sake of safe people's safety. Yeah, exactly. Police using good old gumshoe work paired with advanced technology pieced together the last few hours of the couple's mm-hmm. lives. Richard using a walker due to a medical issue was recorded on surveillance video between 5.56 and 6.43 p.m. There we go. He was walking to and inside the BC Liquor Store at 1525 West 70th Avenue. The same cameras captured him walking in the direction of his home later. Yeah, so here we go. There you go. Exactly. And when I saw the photos of this elderly man in a walker. Sounds it, frail. It, yeah, yeah, it made me hate this killer even more. Yeah. You know, like you're going to kill this frail old man. Yeah. Like, Somebody who's posing no threat to anybody none, none. is just trying to, by the sounds of it, stay alive. Yeah. Diana's movements were easily tracked as well. Ms. Ma Jones was recorded on surveillance video getting into her Kia Soul after a dance class oh. at 7.08 p.m. She was a tap dancer. That's awesome. And then she went shopping at Costco in Richmond. Her Kia Soul was recorded on surveillance video approaching and parking in front of her residence at 8.01 p.m. (sighs) Just minutes later, she was dead. I don't know why that makes me so, gives me such big chills. Like, oh. She's just doing, she's just bringing in the groceries. Just, and you're. You're not giving a second thought to your life. Yep. Just, okay, so tomorrow when I get to work, what am I going to, am I going to have to do, am I going to have to, should I be doing that? And oh, I guess I should probably put these in the fridge and you're opening the door and then just all of a sudden. Yep. You know, so you see footage and it's, she's alive and and, and the, no idea what's about to happen minutes later. That, she's gone. Yeah. Like yeah. that's just so tragic and it gives me just... Terrible goosebumps, like, oh. The Kia Soul was recorded on video surveillance at around 10.24 p.m., driving away from the Jones residence, Mm. and later at about 10.37 p.m., and parking in the 7700 block of Cartier Street. The keys for the Kia Soul were found in a garden a few houses to the north of where the vehicle was parked. So we get a pretty good timeline now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Video surveillance records showed a small man of Asian heritage walking along West 62nd Avenue, close to where the Kia Soul was left at about 10.45 p.m. Hmm. He's wearing a jacket and carrying a backpack. The backpack does not appear full. Police followed the man's movements, obtaining more footage from the direction he seemed to be walking. They also reviewed video from earlier in that evening, and there he was again, this time wearing a hoodie and carrying what looks like a full backpack. Mm. The man was captured on video at 7789 Birch Street at approximately 7.30 p.m., walking in the general direction of the Jones residence. Police surmised that it it was his kill kit inside with the jacket that he was observed wearing later in the video after the murders. Yeah, and a lot of it was left behind. The police zeroed in on the Canadian Tire Store at 8277 Ontario Street in Vancouver using the barcode taken from the handle of the hatchet. 
they had to watch video of multiple purchases of the tools before the murder. So everybody who rang that through, yep. they had the video yep. to correspond. All of a sudden, there was their guy, the same man seen near the Kia. From video recorded on September 13th, 2017, two weeks before the murders, here he was purchasing a hatchet, a baseball cap with the Loon logo, and gloves. God, I love technology. A month into the investigations, investigators caught a better glimpse of the man they had believed to be the killer. The man was chillingly deliberate but calm while making his purchases for his kill kit. Mm. Earlier frames from the video showed the man stopping at a knife display and picking up a knife similar to the one found on the lawn of the Jones residence. He ogles the blade for a couple of moments before he puts it back. How bloody creepy. Using the timestamp in the video, police matched the purchase with a bank card. After going through the legal process of determining who the cardholder was, the VPD finally had a name, and it was a weird one. Rocky Rambo Way Nam Khan. Say what? Rocky Rambo Way Nam Khan. Rocky Rambo, he must have changed his name to that or something. That's just, well, that's just bizarre. You will find out later. It is weird. Police started looking into Kam's background. His roommate would later say that Kam was soft-spoken and unassuming, but seemed depressed. He played video games competitively to help support himself, but it was still not enough to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. They were living at 7608 Granville Street, just a two-minute walk from where Diana Ma Jones' Kia was found and a 12-minute walk from the murder scene. Oh, wow, okay. From court documents, quote, Mr. Kam was 25 years old in September 2017. He was raised in Hong Kong. Mr. Kam started playing video games while going to high school in Hong Kong. And after graduating high school, he moved to Calgary to attend university and obtained a Bachelor of Economics degree. All right. He spent much of his time playing video games when he was going to university as well. After graduating from there, he continued playing video games and reading online comic books. He applied for jobs in Calgary, but was unable to find employment. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us relate to that so far. Sure. Around May or June of 2017, the man moved to Vancouver, and after moving here, he lived in a hostel until he found rental accommodation at... 7608 Gravel Street. Mm. He continued to send out resumes when he was living in Vancouver, but he wasn't very motivated to obtain employment. Mm -hmm. The only involvement he had with the police prior to these offenses was that he had a motor vehicle accident in Calgary earlier that year, 2017. Okay. So, so no yeah. criminal record at yeah. all. Off the radar, as they would say. Completely. Police began surveilling Cam and set a plan in motion to capture his DNA. It was not as tough as they thought it would be. A pretty female undercover officer approached Cam, playing helpless. She asked for his help to open a bottle of water. He took the bottle from her, opened it, handed it, and the cap back to her. She thanked him and scuttled away to secure the, the bottle and its cap for evidence. Sure enough, when the results came back, the odds were extremely high that the DNA they had captured from Rocky Rambo Wayne Com proved he was the killer. Diana Ma Jones' last heroic efforts to fight her attacker, securing his DNA under her fingernails, was a linchpin in the case developing against the diminutive murderer. That was bloody easy yeah. to get his DNA. I, he just wasn't paying attention, or he's never watched, like, know, Matlock. But I think a lot of us, like, whenever we're watching true crime shows or whatever, it's typically they need to get, like, we got to wait for him to take a sip from the cup, or we got to pick up a, um, well, a, touch a tissue. Touch DNA But, now, yeah, I mean, so, but I think a lot of us don't necessarily think about touch DNA, and it was like, that's brilliant. Though, cause, and it, most people would be like, oh, yeah, sure, okay, I'll help you. VPD picked up Cam and brought him in for questioning. The entire painful nine-hour interview is available to watch at the Vancouver oh. Sun's YouTube link that we'll provide in our show notes. Watch at your peril. It's like watching paint dry. The interrogator, Sergeant Leah Terpsma, tries with all her skill to get Cam to confess, but amid sighs and sometimes giggles from the man, he pretty much sticks with, I have nothing to say for the entire nine hours. Oh, God. Here are two of the most interesting minutes of audio between the two. So, Rocky, one more time then. 
Why is your DNA on this knife outside the house where these people were killed? Can I have an explanation for that? I have nothing to say. Rocky, I want you to notice that there's um there's um an image of you here at the uh, Canadian Tire, and you are buying a hatchet, a pair of gloves, and a hat. The hatchet and the hat uh, are at the house, the exact same make and model as you bought, and the same hat that you bought, same brand, same logo, same everything is at the house where those people were killed. Do you have an explanation for that? I have nothing to say. You know, Rocky, I can sit there and I can feel that you are feeling something. I can see that you're emotional. Why aren't you taking this chance to at least express remorse? Maybe today you're not ready to talk about the whole ugly story, but at least Say you're sorry. For what? For what? You're an animal. She storms out, slams the door, and he just picks up his water bottle and has a sip, just like nothing's going on. She's awesome. Whether or not it's the right thing to do, I have no idea. I'm not a bloody officer of the law, but yeah. I loved how she, because it went on for nine hours, so it's not like she just was like five minutes and, all right, screw you. But I just, like, she tried to show compassion and put her hand on his shoulder, and I can see you're emotional and this and that. Yeah. And he's, for what? And you could just, she's just like, you could tell her mind is like, fuck you, fuck that, you know, and just closes up. You can hear her close up her, her book and everything. Yeah, her and then just with all the pictures. In you're it. an animal. And still like, yeah, maybe it, when you're sitting in front of him, you could see some emotion to me, aside from that moment where he put his hand up, it looked like he was enjoying it. Like he, well, he I went had, through parts of the video, like mm -hmm. extended parts of it. I didn't watch the full nine hours because <laughs> I, <laughs> you yeah. have a life. Yeah. But you can see him laughing. Yeah. In different parts, like giggling. Yeah, that's what you you'd mentioned. It. I don't. Yeah, to me, it looks like he's enjoying the attention. Enjoying the attention. Enjo enjoying that. Like, he's, um, he's kind of toying with her. Yeah. Whoa. But he he looks totally. Yeah. Not that there's a look. Sitting there is killer, shorts. And but his, he looks like I, New I, England Patriots. That should he's a New, yeah, New England right? Patriots fan. Exactly. That should tell everybody. And Tom Brady. Yeah. But there's a possibility i've sat next to this guy on the train or something sure. so like he just looks like your normal regular everyday schmo yeah yeah 25 year old dude i don't typically read youtube comments as they tend to be a cesspool of ugliness <laughs> but some of them on this video were so humorous oh really, and really in a dark way yeah if you want to go check it out read them yourself if you dare yeah on november 7 2017 less than two months after the slayings vancouver police arrested rocky rambo waynom com he was charged with two counts of first degree murder by crown counsel in relation to the murders of diana ma jones 65 and richard jones 68 of vancouver the investigation had involved more than 240 VPD employees, mm. the canvassing of more than 1,000 homes and businesses, mm -hmm. hundreds of hours of video evidence, and a price tag of about $600,000. Cam, of course, like all scumbags do, pled not guilty. It's so fucking frustrating, because at that point, you know he knows he's caught. You've yeah. got your goddamn DNA photos. In the photos that you could see her showing him of, of buying the hatchet and stuff, it looked so clear. Yeah. Like, it wasn't, like, it's some far clear. away. No, it's like really look, clear. It's like a close-up on. Like, I'll post links to them. You'll be able to see yourself. So he clearly knows. Oh, yeah, they got me. But he's just going to have the fun of making them go through all of this trouble. and mo Let's see what they have. Like, sadistic piece of shit. In jail. Com began talking. Mm. Speaking with a defense-appointed psychiatrist, he admitted 
to having killed the Joneses. Dr. Shen, speaking in Cantonese, interviewed Mr. Cam at North Fraser Pretrial Center on five occasions, September 3rd, 6th, October 5th, November 26th, and December 2nd, mm. 2019. On three occasions, Dr. Shen and Mr. Cam discussed the killings. Cam told Dr. Shen that his father, an engineer from Hong Kong, was a big fan of Sylvester Stallone, okay. leading to naming his son Rocky Rambo, Wei Nam, which means powerful male in Chinese. Cam said he hated the name. Well, that's good, because you should. They're stupid. Dr. Shen told defense attorneys that Cam was or was possibly in an altered state, which he described as gaming consciousness, when he killed Mr. Jones and Ms. Ma Jones. In Dr. Shen's opinion, Mr. Cam's history of isolating himself and immersing himself in fantasy in the form of video games and comic books could have loosened his perception of where reality begins and ends. Dr. Shen coined the term gaming consciousness to describe the altered state of consciousness or reality Mr. Cam may have been in the time at which he killed Mr. Jones and Ms. Ma Jones. The term gaming consciousness is not a specific or commonly accepted term, and it was not a diagnosis, but rather a term that Dr. Shen coined as a descriptor. Yeah, that kind of, that kind of pisses me off, you know? Mm -hmm. Like Why, Scott? Um, okay, I can, sure, maybe while you're in I that I played state, Call of Duty for probably 10 years straight. I'm a huge effing gamer. Yeah. Murdered a lot of digital people. But I, I, have, I don't have the urge to go out and well, see what it's like in real life. And, and sure, maybe in the odd case, somebody's consciousness is a little altered and different. But you, it, it doesn't change the fact he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He knew it was wrong. He knew enough to hide. Yeah. He knew enough to not do it in the middle of a street where he, like, totally. he absolutely knew what he was doing. He knew it was wrong and he still did it. Yep. So go the fuck to jail. Yep. During the voir dire leading up to the trial, Dr. Shen took the stand laying out the idea of gaming consciousness for the court. Oh, Dr. Shen. According to a Global News report, quote, Shen said that when Cam was asked about committing the violent crimes, he hit a wall. He felt no remorse. He felt no anxiety, the doctor told the court. He could not give an explanation of why he didn't feel these feelings. Under cross-examination, the Crown argued that Shen has no training in forensic interview techniques and no professional experience interviewing people who claim to have, quote, gaming consciousness, which is a term he coined. Good on you, Crown. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. The judge decided to allow the strange defense anyway. Oh, shit. Just because they're allowing it doesn't mean it's going to yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At trial in early 2020, the Crown laid out the mountain of evidence against Cam. Along with the damning video evidence, even more compelling was that they had Cam's DNA matching that found on the knife, the hat, and the material under Diane's fingernails. Mm -hmm. Diana's fingernails. But the final nail in Cam's coffin was that Diana Ma Jones' blood was found on the inside hinge of his own glasses. Oh. It had splashed there during the murders. After Dr. Shen testified for the defense, Cam testified saying he was playing video games for as much as 15 hours a day. Me too. Yeah, I, I have done that a lot a in lot. my life. Yeah. 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 Neither of us are murderers that I'm aware of. I don't know. No. I, I don't spend 24 hours a day with you. No, I don't think I've murdered anybody. Yeah, I'm pretty certain that I haven't either. I'm thinking. I'm, I'm going back in the old uh, noggin here. Nope, yeah. nobody murdered. From court documents, Cam described the events on the evening of September 26, 2017. He testified that he was walking in the Marpole area around 7.30 or 8 p.m. when he saw Mrs. Ma Jones stop her car, get out, and take some groceries into the house. Cam said that Ms. Ma Jones left the trunk open, so he knew she was coming back. Cam said that after he saw Ms. Ma Jones, he hid behind a tree, put down his backpack, and armed himself with his hatchet and pocket knife. He could not remember if he put his gloves on. After Ms. Ma Jones was going into the house, a second time after collecting the rest of her groceries, Mr. Cam charged toward the house and forced his way in, end quote. Oh, wow. He clearly went out with the intention of doing something because he had the backpack full of shit mm -hmm. with him. He went out for dinner before, too. Yeah. So he clearly, like, 
he wasn't he in was the video looking. game when it went for yeah, dinner. He, yeah. he was out looking. Yeah. He was hunting. Yes. I will read a little bit of Cam's testimony written verbatim by Global News reporters uh, Simon Little and Ramina Daya. As Cam's first language uh, was Cantonese, the testimony is a little bit broken, but it's no less chilling. Yeah, I got to spend some time with Ramina Daya. She was very nice. There you go. Yeah. Quote, I cover her mouth. I moved my hand down her throat to try and stop her from screaming. And when that didn't work, I used my other hand on her throat. I just tried to choke her, Cam told the court. After she stopped moving, I pick up my knife. I pick up my pocket knife. I'm not sure of order. I believe I stabbed her. Cam told the court of how he then heard a noise from the back of the home and hid behind a set of stairs as Richard Jones entered the kitchen. As soon as Mr. Jones walk into kitchen, I stab him. I just keep stabbing him. It goes on for a while. I thought in my head, how come he didn't die when he tried to stand up? I'm not sure if I stab him or push him to the floor, said Cam. I go into living room, pick up Hatchet. I use Hatchet and chopped him on neck. Cam then described dragging Ma Jones into the kitchen and tying both victims' legs to a chair, an action he couldn't explain. He then cut them loose and dragged their bodies into the shower stall in the bathroom. End quote. Whew. Yeah. Uh, I do believe him when he's saying, like, I don't remember if I put the gloves or there. And this isn't a fucking video game consciousness, but I, you, I, I'm sure in these states, we've all been in a very highly excited or panicked state. Sure. And your brain is pretty scattered. So, yeah, you might not remember which order or anything, but you certainly remember and know that you're killing somebody. Well, this guy spent more than two hours in the house after the murders. Holy shit. Again, from court documents, quote, Mr. Cam testified that after dragging both bodies to the bathroom, he walked around the house. He found $30 in the guest bedroom and some keys. He drank some milk from the refrigerator because he was thirsty, and he ate a peach. Mr. Cam's evidence is that he went back to the bathroom and emptied Mr. Jones and Miss Ma Jones' pockets, he found some lighters, car keys, wallets, and perhaps a pager in their pockets. Mr. Cam then moved their bodies into the shower area. Mr. Cam testified that it was difficult to close the door of the shower and that he cannot remember how the shower turned on, conveniently, because he's trying to cover up evidence. Mr. Cam then collected some items, including the car keys, some bananas, paper towels, and the items he had found in Mr. Jones and Ms. Ma Jones' pockets and put them in a grocery bag. Mr. Cam testified that he put his hoodie and some peaches in his backpack. Just, you know, he's going shopping in this house that mm -hmm. he's just killed the people. Mr. Cam's evidence is that he took the peaches because he liked peaches. Well, they are delicious. The baseball hat that was found under the table had been in his backpack. Mr. Cam testified he did not notice it had dropped on the floor when he was leaving. Mr. Cam left the house by the back door and went in the direction of the Kia Soul. He testified that as he was leaving the residence, he saw a woman walking by and hid in the bushes because he did not want her to see him. He believed that the hatchet and starfrit knife fell when he was leaving the house. He testified that if he had noticed they'd fallen, he would have picked them up. He said that he took the Kia Soul because it was there and he didn't want to walk home. So it's just a 12 minute walk. After getting in the Kia Soul, Mr. Cam saw another woman walking on the sidewalk. He testified that he stayed in the car until the woman went past because he did not want to be seen. So here's two people who walk by him. He's hiding. Mm -hmm. If that's not evidence like that you you're feeling guilty. You know what you're doing guilty. is wrong. Right. Yes. Exactly. And these poor people had no idea how close they were to a multiple <sighs> murderer. Jesus, could you imagine finding out that was you who walked by and you're just like... Holy shit. Uh, yeah, you just get that hot feeling in oh your my tummy. God. After the woman passed, Mr. Cam went back into the Jones residence to double check on something. He testified he couldn't remember what he checked on. That's probably when he turned the water on. But he returned to the house. Mr. Cam changed his shoes because they had blood on them and put on some slippers he found by the back door. Mr. Cam testified that he drove for a while before he, quote, woke up and realized he was doing something wrong. He stopped at a dumpster and threw out a number of items, including the shopping bag containing some of the items he had taken from the Jones residence. Mr. Cam then drove north and parked the Kia Soul in the 7700 block of Cartier Street. 
Mr. Cam described the circuitous route he took back to the house. Mr. Cam walked north on Cartier Street and through the car keys into a garden and then turned south and walked on West 67th Avenue where he turned left and then walked down an alley, went through a yard between French Street and Granville Street to his home. Okay. 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 Okay, let's hear it. I woke up and realized that I was doing something wrong. You Haven't you never done that, Scott? Well, I mean, yeah, but it's usually like, oh, how did these Doritos get in my belly? That's when I realized I was doing something wrong. No, you fucking lug nut. You realized that from the very beginning, from being sneaky, from hiding in the bushes afterwards. From when you bought your hatchet. From when you bought your hatchet and the mm. hat. From when you sat in the car waiting for somebody to go yeah. by as to not be seen. Because if you didn't realize you weren't doing anything wrong, mm. you would have just walked out when that person was coming by. You're like, hey, how, how's your day? You know, like, yeah. that's how, they, that means you don't realize you're doing. But when you're like, oh, shit, somebody's going to see me. Yeah. Yeah. You know you're doing something wrong, you dolt. The cross-examination of Cam was rough because the Crown Prosecutor was a smart cookie. Yeah. He saw his opportunity and he went at the young man. Good. From a Global News article, quote, Crown Prosecutor Daniel Mulligan says that Cam, who has described forcing his way into the home with a hatchet in one hand and pocket knife in the other, intended to kill. But Cam denied on Wednesday that that was the case. When I get out of my house, I have no thought of killing some people, Cam said. With your hatchet and two knives and your gloves and your baseball hat, Mulligan replied, referring to the items Cam says he left home with before arriving at the couple's home. Mm -hmm. And shampoo, Cam corrected, laughing. <sighs> Is that funny, Mulligan asked. It's not funny, Cam replied. I don't understand why you keep suggesting otherwise. Because you just... End quote. Because you just laughed. Oh, and I had some shampoo in there, too. So he's, like, trying he's to He's trying to dismiss... Well, I put, I put all kinds of weird things in my bag. Yeah. Oh, you... How, like, how stupid do people like him think the world is? Very. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. In another heated exchange, Mulligan asked Cam how he had obtained the knife and hatchet in his hand. If it were a video game, then did he push a button on his keyboard to make them appear? <laughs> Mulligan asked... Cam feigned not understanding the question, of course, and Mulligan finished the exchange saying, it was not like a video game at all, was it? Cam did not answer. Mm -hmm. Rocky Rambo Wei Nam Cam was found guilty on both charges. As the court found the killings were premeditated, he was held for sentencing. Yeah, his family should also get a sentence for giving him a stupid name. The night before Cam's sentencing, some of Diana Maud Jones' tap dance classmates and friends spoke with Global News. Oh. Here's some of that. Every step, every beat resuscitates memories. We loved her. She was so vibrant and how young and how enthusiastic she was and how beautiful she was. I'm so inspired by her independence, her braveness, uh, how fit she was. Your troubles away. Diana Maud Jones, 64 years young, a dedicated dancer, friend and occupational therapist. Diana Ma Jones has demonstrated creativity and one final rehearsal, September 26, 2017. It's the last time the group saw their friend alive. Jan phoned me, I was at work, and she said I had some really bad news. And it's hard for it to sink in when you hear really bad news. A random attack, the motive still unclear. Rocky Rambo Waynam Cam, a university graduate with no mental health or criminal history, slashed 68-year-old Richard Jones more than a hundred times and cut the throat of Ma Jones in the couple's home. There's no reason that he should have uh, attacked Diana. So that, that boggles my mind. Rocky, it's over. A key piece of evidence, a tiny speck of Ma Jones's blood discovered on the hinge of Cam's glasses. His DNA found under Ma Jones's fingernails. She would have fought till the end. It would have been like he'd been in a cat fight. No, she was. She was ferocious, but only ferocious when she had to be strong, like it was her strength and her toughness that so it would have been horrible absolutely horrible ma jones's friends 
disappointed with defense's theory that Cam thought he was in a violent video game when he murdered the couple. But how did this young man slip through the system? I would love to know um, what what was his motivation. A pile of painful questions which will never be answered. The group now hoping for a just sentence. If it's the two cent two life sentences, it's to me it's fair because there are two lives lost. And um, if it's not, then we're okay because we're just going to keep going and keep dancing and remember her always. Romina Dea, Global News. You know, sadly, it's way too easy to slip through the cracks. Oh, yeah. Especially if you're traveling from one nation to another, medical mm. records aren't going to sure. follow. Yep. But also, you're not telling people, you're fantasizing about killing people. No. Like, you can't just be like, I don't know, Mike seems a bit odd. I think I'm going to alert the authorities. We've had, Maybe we we used to, to work with a lot of odd people. If we were call, if you had to alert the authorities based on people, you go, that guy's just off. There were a couple of people who I thought were real psychopaths oh, who used to work oh, on, same. on the TSR floor. Way too many. Way too many where you're yeah. like, oh, there's, mm, I yeah, don't the, want to see this person's bedroom. This person lies like a rug, number one. You know, yeah. it's yep. just like, oh my gosh. But it's... The, you, you can't just say this person needs to go into a psych ward because they seem odd. No. So unless they are doing or Bring saying Bring on the stuff, thought police. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's time for the minority report. Uh, unless, yeah, unless they are vocalizing mm -hmm. that they want to do some harm. Yep. Then they slip through the cracks. Justice Laura Giroux sentenced Cam to two life sentences without the possibility of parole for 25 years. The Crown had asked for 50 years of parole and mm -hmm. eligibility, but Giroux found that harsh. Here's the Crown prosecutor Mulligan speaking to Global News outside the courthouse on the day of the sentencing. Well, that's not the result we were hoping for, but it's clear that Madam Justice Giroux carefully considered the law and the circumstances and the important thing to remember is that Mr. Cam has been sentenced to life in jail with no parole for 25 years. So it will be 2042 before he can apply for parole. And as Madam Justice Giroux pointed out, there's no guarantee that he will get parole. Well, it's based on the circumstances of the offense, the nature of the crime, and the lack of an explanation for why uh, Mr. Cam committed these murders. Hopefully, during the course of his time in custody, through psychological assessment, that explanation will come forward. So here's the thing. Here's what I think. Here's my opinion about what his motive was. Mm -hmm. He wanted to go out and see what it felt like to hunt humans and kill somebody. That's what he wanted to do. Yep. I, I agree. I think, did video games play a role in what he did? No. Mm. Did he play violent video games because of an already established uh, flaw in his behavior? Like, was he already, he, most likely he was already a psychopath or leaning in, in that direction. Yeah. Gravitated towards video games. Like, it's, the video games aren't the cause. His fucked up brain mm -hmm. and upbringing and all of that is, yeah, he wanted to see what it was like to kill. Somebody. To kill. Yeah. Yep. The, what, the, Plain the, and simple, I complete, think he got yeah, off on it. His complete lack of remorse. You can see when he's being interviewed, his, mm -hmm. his, his the, the uh, I believe, enjoyment he's getting out of yep. the whole thing. Yeah, he knew what he was doing and he wanted to and probably doesn't regret it to this day. Hey, Rocky Rambo, you got to punch me face. I'm, I'm saying that because he does. He he's going to punch me name. I really hate his name. A punch me name? Yeah, I really hate his name. Well, I mean, he said he did too. Yeah, well, good, good. But, but it, just because you like, hate your name doesn't mean you should be going out killing people it's either. It's just this uber masculine, like yeah. Rocky Rambo, and then whatever the, the, the middle two names were, which meant like strong man or something like that. But it's looking just, at him, you don't think any of those things. No, no. Because he was, no. I mean, you and I are both smaller mm -hmm. in stature, mm -hmm. and and we look like monsters compared to this guy. And he looks meek. Yeah, he looked pretty meek. Stupid name. 
Well, that's it for this week's episode. Oh, that one's gone. That was. I, I quite uh, I, I quite enjoyed doing it because there was some conclusion for me having known mm. about the incident, but not really knowing right how it concluded. There was like so I really got to kind of oh that's how that happened or that's how that ended and uh, yeah it's pretty disturbing the this whole is, thing. This is a very bizarre one and very violent. I keep putting myself in the o- shoes of those poor officers yeah. walking in to that scene. Knowing what you're going to walk into, you, you, see the, you tend you see to be it, obsessed on that the initial shock, yeah, because I, I of do, yeah. what you went through when you were a kid. I yeah, think, yeah, because every time we talk about this mm, kind of thing, yeah, you you always go back to that well every That's single a very, time. Very very interesting observation. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying one way or another about it. Like, no, it is I think what it that's is. I think that's a really interesting observation, and there's absolutely got to be some linkage there because yeah because that would have been for me I, I guess looking at it i walked in and what the uh, what is going on yeah and so yeah i just like because yeah i i really easily relate to people like that so i picture you as the officer it was a goddamn bloody hatchet yeah and you're like okay i know i'm not gonna say anything good right and then you go in and oh god yeah it's just horrifying uh-huh uh-huh yeah well, I guess it's uh, voicemail time. Yeah, let's get that stupid name out of my head. Rocky Rambo. <laughs> the last Rambo movie really sucks, by the way. Well, I think most of them did. But I, I watched it. Did just, you? Just because. After this? No, no. Oh, I thought you meant this. like it made you go, like, no, yeah, you know, I should give it a shot. No, I really stunk. That's what I, I assumed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you assumed correctly. Yeah. All right, uh, let us do some voicemails. If you want to call us, you can do so at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N, and leave us a voicemail. If your call stands out, you might hear it on the show. Some people have said I've called and I haven't heard it, and I'm like, uh-huh. okay, we have a lot. Let, yeah, let it, let us know the date. Yeah, if you want to contact us and say I called. Yep. Yeah. Let me know the date yeah. and I'll go back and look and we'll play it. If yeah. it's, if it's not more than two or three minutes <laughs> long. Yeah. Yeah. Because we usually, we like to try to keep the calls about a minute and a half. So. Oh, I want to give a, a quick shout out before mm-hmm. uh, to a uh, uh, listener whose birthday it is. Laura, Laura Lee Crawford. Oh, I, I was wrong. I said Laura. She's like, no, it's like not Laura. her birthday anymore. It's like it's Scott. It'll be Monday. Well, it is when I'm talking into the microphone. Oh, okay. But I uh, uh, went out to dinner with her and her friend, her sisters tonight. What a lovely um, Abby and Kate. Just a lovely group of people. Well, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. All right. Let's get to it. Let's listen to this one. Okay. Hi, Mike. Hi, Scott. My name is Julia from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And um, I discovered your guys' podcast maybe. Maybe like four months ago, and I have I only listen to your podcast now, and I'm obsessed with it, and I've gotten so many of my friends into it, and it just makes my days a lot easier with quarantine, where I'm just around the house cleaning and listening to your show. So thank you for always putting out cool things. I'm super excited every Monday, and go shit in your hat. <laughs> Bye. Well, thanks, Julia. Um, we're always glad that our yeah. our show helps people clean. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. get a lot of that. Wish actually. that rubbed off on me. No, me, me, uh, me, me too. And we, I'm glad we could bring you some um, quarantine joy. But here's the thing: there are some other there are other shows that are great. Yeah, and feel free to listen to those too for sure. As long as you keep listening to Dark Poutine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah don't, we don't we don't have to be the only podcast you listen to. Don't abandon us. We, we yeah, ha- don't we, abandon us. We have abandonment. We have podcast abandonment. You issues. have no idea how uh, how strong the abandonment issues in both of us are. No, he's not kidding. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he's not kidding. It's crazy. Yeah, come we on. are actually quite broken. Listen and then come hug us. <laughs> Let's listen to this one. It looks like it's somebody who lives in Arizona. Well, hello, guys. I've been waiting to call. I've been busy like we all have, and this COVID stuff is not any fun. My name is Cheryl. I live in Prescott, Arizona, but here we call it Prescott. I have got to tell you guys, when you talked about the show Ozark, I want you to know, yes, it's real. I moved here to Arizona 25 years ago from the Lake of the Ozarks, where the film or the the TV show 
um, is mostly filmed at. Yes, it's a real place. Yes, that show is extremely accurate. I worked and ran a resort there, and yes, money is laundered through there. It's not uncommon. Bodies hide in the lake. It's uh, it's a great place to hide should you want to disappear for a while. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Used to take my boat to work. Anyway, I just thought I'd let you guys know I love your show and that, yes, you watch that show, you'll know where I lived. But not anymore. Now I'm in the big uh, mountains of Arizona at 6,000 feet. I run a little Airbnb. Should you ever all want to come to Arizona, just look me up. It's Reed's Open Old B&B. And you don't have to shit in your hat because I got myself a toilet. I got three. Anyway, love you guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. She, she got herself a toilet. She done did? She done did. Uh, yeah, we're hey, proud babies. of you for, for pooping in your toilet. Well, that was great, Cheryl. Um, mm. And it's a great reminder for me to finish watching Ozark. There you go. I it's, love that yeah, show. It's a great show, idea, but I just I, I didn't I didn't finish it, so I need to do that. Oh, I did. I love Here's uh, one from Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. Speaking of, hey, babies. <laughs> Let's listen to this. Hey, y'all. My name is Casey. I'm from Mississippi. Just wanted to call and say how much I love the show. I deliver mail, so I'm always in the car alone, and y'all definitely help me make it through the day. Also, your Canadian accents are just icing on the cake for me. Thank you for all you do, and keep up the good work. Oh, and go and shit in your hat. Bye, y'all. Short and sweet, Casey. Short and sweet. <laughs> oh, God, that is one of my favorite accents. I don't know why I, I love, love it. I love the southern so, accent. There's yeah. just such a kindness to it. Yeah. It's it's very sing-song. Yeah. 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 Whereas we're just kind of like, Bleh. Yeah. Yeah, she says she likes our accents, but uh, I, I don't know. Well, it's not an accent when you have it. Yeah. It's when other people hear it. Yeah, true. It's not an accent to us, Mike. Right. Okay, let's listen to one more. We've got one more. Okay. Hi, Mike and Scott. My name is Maddie. I'm from York, Saskatchewan. Um, I went to high school with Michaela Bali, and I was interested to see if anyone's done a podcast on her disappearance. So I looked her up on the podcast app, found you guys, and have been listening ever since. Um, I go to school in Kamloops, BC, so kind of close to you guys. And ever since I've been listening, you guys are so awesome. You're so respectful to the victim, the victim's families, and you give a lot of information. So that's really good to hear. Yeah, keep doing your thing. Have a good one. Bye. Well, that was really sweet. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very nice. Yeah. And I, that wow, what a, a, a small world you. Right. Well, but that's the thing. That's kind of the intent of the show, too, is to talk to people who know some of these folks. Yeah. Because yeah. people from smaller towns or other places other than Toronto or Vancouver never hear about their places. Yeah. Well, it, you, the thing I find, like even like today's episode, I sit there and I'm constantly thinking, I wonder if I've ever crossed paths with any of these people. Yeah. You might have. Because like, it's, I mean, it's quite possible even if it's just walk past them or something it's absolutely not the craziest thought and nope. so it's a very when you can have that thought of oh jesus it's so close i may have walked past them yeah it really hits it's scary yeah well that's it for voicemails again if you want to leave us one you can call us at one 327 5786 um, I guess it's on to a Patreon. It is. Yeah. It is that time. It is that time. So first up, we have Chantelle Oosterhuis. Okay. And she is from Aurelia, Ontario. Oh, Aurelia. What does she do in Aurelia? Uh, she is an oyster farmer. Well, I'm pretty sure that Oosterhuis might be Huis, or I'm sure I'm slaughtering your name, but... <laughs> I'm sure that that might actually be oyster. Well, she yeah, she's keeping in the family lineage. Yeah, you know, she's following family tradition, family name. Um, she's not doing it right though. Yep, she's not doing it right okay. because she's she thinks that she actually if she plants clams in dirt or oy oysters a, in dirt, she gets pearls. That they'll a no pearl tree. more oysters will yeah, that's grow. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. So, 
So next up, we have Mary Lee Prince from Temple, Georgia. Nice name. Georgia. What a nice name. Yep. What does Mary Lee do in Georgia? She's a dog trainer. Well, great. Yep. What kind of dogs does she train? Uh, um, St. Bernard's. I'm just trying to think of what's that one. Oh, St. Bernard's, yeah. yeah. Bernard's, yep. And and Great Danes. She sticks to only tall breeds. Oh. Yep. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's uh, because she herself is seven foot eight. Oh. Yeah, and so she it's just easier for her to manage them. Well, next we have uh, somebody from who knows where named Millie Mills. I knows where. Where? Uh, Nassau in the Bahamas. Nassau, you mean. That's what I, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. That's what I said. Okay. Well, when you're there, though, like, they like to say sometimes Nassau. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. But yeah, in, in the Bahamas, the, the good old Bahamas. Excellent. Yeah. And what does she do there? She plants coconut trees. Great. Yeah. Good. Because, I mean, what's the Bahamas without coconut trees, right? Am I right? I just think about, when I think of coconuts, I think of Monty Python and the Holy Grail when they're riding across, pretending to ride horses. And they don't actually oh, have them, but yeah. they have the guys behind yeah. them doing the coconut. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. yeah. Until, for a second, I'm like, where is he going with this? And I'm like, I remember. Yeah. So she plants coconut trees, Good. one a week. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's not very many. Have you ever tried to plant a coconut tree? No, I have not. Do you think you could do it in a week? Probably not. Exactly. Uh, next, we have a PM, another prime minister. Oh, sweet. And her name is Bridget Chang, and she's from oh, Stillwell, Bridget. Kansas, oh. in the United States of America. Yep. And uh, what does Bridget do? Bridget um, is a, a Bridget likes to raise other people's children. So she's a babysitter. No, or no, it's not even that. No, like a nanny. No, a no, a no pair. Not that's even a, that. That's the fancy that word. That is the fancy. That's when you bring them overseas. No, no, not even that. What? No, no. She just she sees. Does she? I hope she's pretty, not taking them. It's pretty creepy, but she'll see like a really like that looks like a really sweet child, and then she'll go and meet the parents and talk to them. Can I raise your parent? Can Ra I raise, raise your, your child? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Nobody has yet to take her up on the offer, so it's, it's not. I wouldn't know. I don't know if you'd call it employment. Not very lucrative. It, yeah, I mean, she might want to rethink the whole thing. Yeah, because people typically like a stranger, like, hey, do you mind if I raise your child? Yeah, not. Gonna it doesn't fun. get much further than that. The conversation. Uh, next, we have Samantha Dimmock. Do we? And she is from Spruce Grove, Alberta. Oh, um, sounds lovely. And I don't know why, but when I saw her name, I thought Dimmock, the death touch, you know, from Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. But anyway, mm -hmm. so what does uh, Samantha Dimmock do in Spruce Grove? Oh, she owns and operates a Dungeons and Dragons shop. Okay. Yeah. Are there actual dragons in her shop? No, Mike, it's the game. I don't know if you've ever heard of the <laughs> oh, game. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mike, geez, no real I dragons. I have heard of the game and yeah. have actually played it. She sells uh, dice. Like she, the dice, that's one of the things she sells there. The many-sided die. The, yeah, the many-sided die. I guess probably Dungeons & Dragons boards. Hmm. Do they have boards? I don't know. Not... No, they don't. Okay, well, then she doesn't... They have, we'll have a map, maybe. That's what I meant by board. But, okay. That's what I meant by board. So, yeah, I, like, I don't, I've never been there. I don't You've never played D&D? &D? No. Okay. No. You're not that nerdy, then. No, no, no. Next up, we have, from Logan, Utah, oh. Kathy Davenport. Hey, Kathy Davenport. What does Kathy do in Logan? She's a car salesman. Oh, what kind of cars? Uh, Saturn's. No, that's mm -hmm. too bad. Mm -hmm. They don't make those anymore. I know. We should probably tell her. <laughs> I think we just did. Well, I think, oh, I really hate to break it to you, but they haven't made your, or sold your cars in like 10 years. Next, from Ottawa, Ontario, oh. we have Jennifer Pruel. Mm -hmm. What does Jennifer do in uh, Ottawa? Uh, what she does, she drools professionally. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. For what purpose? It beats the hell. What end? It beats the hell out of me. I didn't ask. Pretty, I pretty much ended it right there. She's like, I'm like, what? Hey, it's a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing this evening? What do you do? What do you do for a living? I'm a professional drooler. Oh wow! And I just at that point, I'm just like, well, that's outstanding. You lost um, me a drooler. I uh, I have to pee, and then I walk off. There you go. Yeah, I didn't get into it. <laughs> You kind of don't want to. No. All right. Let's move on to our Donut Money donors. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Irene Brand, of course. 
Thank you, Irene. Thank You're you. so awesome. And next up, we have Corey Sullivan. Hi, Mike and Scott. Have some donuts on me. You good eggs. Keep up the good work. If Corey. You, if you insist, Corey. And what does will. Corey do, and where does he live? Well, Corey actually runs and owns a donatorium. And where does he live? Oh, uh, I don't know really. I don't know how they pronounce it. I pronounce it uh, Castries in St. Lucia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I pronounce it Castries. Okay. Yeah. Which I'm sure is exactly how it's pronounced. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And he owns, he owns a donut shop. In there, there you go. Well, that's why he wants, he wants us to come spend the money that he just sent us. Well, I think that's all his, that's his uh, plan, but. Uh, it's hard Saint, to get there. St. Lucia. St. Lucia is nowhere near here. No. So the money we would, like, it would just be quite an endeavor to spend 20 bucks of donuts at his place. Just keep your 20 bucks and eat your own donuts. All right. Uh, and last but not least, we have Mallory Good. Mm -hmm. Says, hi, guys. Long time listener. First time donut moneyer. <laughs> Honey dip for the win. Keep on being fabulous. Mar Mallory Good from Elmira, Ontario. Oh. Bonus points if you can name two things Elmira is, is famous for. What is Elmira famous for, Scott? Uh, one is is uh, our our, Patri our PayPal moneyer. Okay. Yeah, famous for her. Um, I'm gonna say like there's probably so like most places will have like you know there's like a big moose or something. I think probably there it's probably like they have a giant squid. Well, I know that uh, um, actually Malcolm Gladwell, the author, is from there. Oh, I uh, that, that was that I was just about to go there. <laughs> you were just about yep. to go there. Yep. Okay, that's mm -hmm. one thing that it's famous for. Yep. I mean, uh, there's other things. Um, there gazebos. are gazebos. They have a lot of gazebos. Oh, yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. And Dennis Weidman, the NHL oh. player, he's from there. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So those are two things. So I get bonus points. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if those are the things that she uh, she's referring to. So I don't know. I really doubt it. But it coincidentally fits hand in hand with what she does for a living. Which is what? She writes trivia questions. Oh. Well, I know, you know what else I know that Elmira is famous for? What's that? Maple syrup. Oh, maple syrup is delicious. Yeah. Now, are, we, are you sure she hasn't confused it with Elvira? No, that's the mistress of the dark. Yeah, because we can name some famous things about her. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Specifically. Yeah. <laughs> Two. <laughs> her chesticles. <laughs> mm. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you so much to our donut money donors. <laughs> Please don't don't hate on us for that. Um, uh, past and present, and our patrons, past and present, for your help to keep us doing what we do. And if you want to show your support of Dark Poutine, you can subscribe at patreon.com slash dark poutine. Or for one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. All you patrons who stuck with us through this pandemic, Woo. you have kept a roof over my head. Many, you have no, many blessings. You have no idea how mm. grateful I am. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot to us if you did. You can easily find us on iTunes Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please give us a like or follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thanks for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night. Or good morning. Guten Tagen. Whatever time of, yeah, we should stop. Yep.
I said to my parents, don't trust her. I wouldn't listen. Every family has a secret. Joy Delaney, mother of four, has gone missing. From the author of Big Little Lies comes a chilling new mystery to W. You were an emotional chaos sinkhole, Amy, and I'm sick of it! Starring Annette Bening. Nobody can break your heart like your own children. And Sam Neill. She will come back. Here we go. Strap in. Apples never fall. All new Thursdays, only on W. Stream on Stack TV.